You're listening to the IGDA Melbourne Podcast, July 2012. Freelancing with Mick Gordon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, hello everybody. I'm just going to make sure that's not going to pull over there. There we go. So, um, yeah, welcome. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. My name is McGordon, and uh, for the past 12 years or so, I've been able to support myself uh, through the wonderful world of what we call freelancing. And I've been doing this by using my skills in sound and music and uh, selling that essentially to different companies. And this is some of the games I've worked on although we're working on. And um, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is the wonderful world of freelancing. Uh, essentially, anybody in this room has skills that somebody else in the world is willing to pay for. Now, these are skills that you've practiced and that you've learned and that you've built up and that you've developed over the years, doing whatever it may be. And there is somebody out there that can't do that needs that, can't do it themselves, requires it, or is being paid to provide that themselves and can't do it. And that's essentially where you're going to come in. So we're going to talk tonight all about freelancing and all that sort of stuff. So um, let's kick it on and uh, we'll get straight into it. So the beginning, the idea, I know, um, you know, I come from a kind of a sound and music background, but we're going to talk solely just about freelancing. We're not going to talk about music and sound or anything like that because these tips, techniques, skills, you know, secrets and all that sort of stuff, you can apply to any industry out there. Whatever you do, whether you make jewelry, whether you, you know, paint cars, whether you're an attorney, whether you, uh, you know, you, you, you count numbers or, you know, whatever you do that's, that you want to turn into a freelancing job, these things will be the same regardless. So the beginning, you want to do this thing. The only advice I have at this stage is that you need to start small. Don't go ahead tomorrow and go and quit your job. Don't, uh, you know, take out a big loan and set up a big studio and all that sort of thing. Start small because you are going to make mistakes you will fail. Everybody fails. It's all part of learning, especially in the world of freelancing where there's no real set path for you to follow. Now, when you have less to risk, you don't fall as hard. So you need to start small and gradually transition into it. But anyway, let's move on to the fun stuff. So I'm going to run through, uh, you know, kind of five tips of getting work, essentially, because that's the first thing we need to do. The first one is to be visible. Your first thing is to be visible. You need to be able to be found by others. So you need to have your website sorted out. You need to have your business cards sorted out. You need to have your public profile, your Facebook things, your Twitter things, any other thing that's out there that you can get yourself out visible. You need to have that. That's the first thing you need to do. You need to describe yourself and, and, and have a clear direction. Be visible. That's the reason. So once you've got that, the second thing is to show off. You need to show off what you can do. You need to show to the world the tips and little funky little things that you can make or that you can create and all that sort of thing. But the trick with this one is that you need to find a way to do it differently. The internet is effectively three billion people or so screaming their heads off for attention and you need to find a way to bust through that, to stand out. You need to find something that is unique to yourself and find a unique way of showing it out there. We've all been sent that YouTube video of somebody doing something different or something cool or that web page or somebody who's done something creative which has never been done before. You need to find something like that. And that is the tricky part. That is the difficult thing. Um, not only that, but as a freelancer, you've got to do that a hell of a lot pretty much all the time. Um, one of my ideas that I came up with last year at GDC... I walked around to everybody that I wanted to work with. So anybody who worked at a studio that I was interested in working with or something like that, I walked around with a little microphone, one that's just like this one here. And I asked them, quite calmly, to make a sound with their voice. And I told them that I was doing this because I wanted to make a song out of voices. And of course, they loved that idea. That was great. So they made a little sound for me, whatever they could with their mouth. And after that GDC, I spent the next 12 months piecing all of that together into a song. It took a long time, a lot of effort and all that sort of stuff. And I ended up finishing it just before GDC this year. I released that song just before GDC started and it went crazy. 
It was on Kotaku, it was on Lifehacker, it was on uh, Gizmodo and all these other places where had interview after interview and you know, press thing after press thing. It was absolutely crazy, it went ridiculous. So there I was walking into GDC with a song that was everywhere, which was tacked to GDC. But not only that, it had everybody that I wanted to work with featured in the song. So when I'm walking into GDC and there's 500 other audio people there going, hire me, hire me, hire me, there I am with this thing already up there. You need to find things like that to get yourself out there. That is the tricky thing. It's nothing somebody else can really tell you. It's an idea process. You've got to get creative and try and get it out there. Just think of different ideas. Come up with things. Try things. They're always going to work, but sometimes they do. Cool. So once you've got that sort of thing, the next stage is to make friends. Don't make clients. Make friends. Get along with people. Speak to people. You know, you've got to essentially convince somebody out there that they're going to give you money to do what you enjoy doing. And in return, you're going to do something that there is value to them. That is a trust relationship. That is a sacred relationship. It's a very difficult relationship to build. And it's best described as a friend relationship rather than a client relationship. Always think about it like, like a telemarketer, for example. You know when the telemarketer, you sit down, you have your dinner and all that sort of thing, and the telemarketer rings, right? It doesn't matter what they're selling. It doesn't matter at all. You're not interested because all they're interested in is selling you something. So you don't want to be that person. You don't want to go around and go, hey, Mitch, can you hire me, man? That'd be great. Thanks. I could do with some money. You don't want to be that person. You want to make friends with people. So many of the people that I've had that work from those credits that were up there before are people that I've worked with from company to company to company. When that company shuts down, all those people disappear and they go to another company. And I begin working with them and then they rehire and et cetera, et cetera. But that's because we get along really well. We're good friends. We're not treating each other like clients. We're good friends. Now, a perfect example of this is an email which I get probably once a week if I'm lucky. And I get a lot of emails from people that are very interested in doing similar sound work to myself. And uh, this is a typical kind of email that I get. This one was particularly bad. And for the people like myself that didn't bring my glasses and all that sort of thing, I'm going to read it out. So <clears throat> this is addressed to me as a composer. Yo, I'm a prolific composer and I who want to make music for video game soundtracks. <laughs> I make all sorts of music like jazz and classical and hip hop and dubstep. <laughs> if you need a composer, my rates are real good and I can work real fast. I want to write music with companies like EA and Blizzard. Can you give me a list of your contacts so I can send them some SoundCloud links? Thanks. And I've blanked their, voice, uh, their uh, credits on uh, name and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, you know, I don't need to tell you what's wrong with that email, but I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of things. First, the grammar and spelling and all that sort of thing is terrible. So straight away, I know this person isn't professional in any way, shape or form. The email nowadays is often our first impression. So we need to make that a first impression that's worthwhile. Secondly, this guy has started off by saying I'm a prolific composer. Obviously doesn't understand the idea of prolific. Um... Next, we've gone on to just asking me about work. Even if I ignored the bad spelling and grammar, it's the fact that he's cutting straight to what he wants. Not what I need or what I might need or not how we might get along really well or he's got the same interests as me or whatever like that or he might be able to help out. It's straight to what he wants. I want to do this. I want to do that. Lastly, he's asked me for my contact list. Assuming that I'm going to give him my contact list and that he's going to send a similar email to all these people. And these contact lists, you know, I may have taken 12 years to develop these relationships. It's something that this person, this individual, doesn't take very seriously. So it's a good example. I get one of those a week. I'm not kidding. So um, the fourth tip is to be ready. Once you've gotten yourself out there, you're visible and you've made some good friends and they want to hire you and, uh, you know, all that wonderful stuff. You need to be ready. You need to have your setup ready. You need to have all your software installed or you need to have your workshop set up or whatever it is that you're going to do. You need to be ready because when that work comes, it's often going to come with a deadline and you need to deliver that deadline. If you don't, that work's probably not going to come back. 
So the last thing is, is be ready. Now, number five is uh, the best way to explain getting work, especially when you're starting out, is that it's not a great portfolio. It's not a great credits list. It's not great contacts. It's not an agent. Uh, it's not a, a good attitude. It's a mash of all of these things together. And that's what gets work. All right, cool. So we're going to move on to the next part. Um, we're going to move pretty fast through this talk, as you can probably tell. I find these things really broad. So what we're going to do is move through the talk pretty well and then give a lot of time for questions, uh, which is why I'm moving pretty quickly. Anyway, so you've gone out there and you're now established. You've got some work coming in. Fantastic. Congratulations. You may have even thought about quitting your job or you already have quit your job at this stage. You're starting to become a, a freelancer. The ball has started rolling. So this is the top five tips for once you've got work, how to keep it. Number one, don't work for free. Don't work for free. Don't work for free. If you charge nothing, your work is worth nothing and you are worth nothing. You must get something. It doesn't always need to be money. Many times I've done bartering deals where I might write some music or make some sounds for somebody and in return they might make a website or, you know, help me out in another way. I did a video recently and, uh, you know, for a girl who was making some funky clothes and uh, she's like, oh, can you do sound? I'm like, yeah, can I have some clothes? And so I made sounds for her and she gave me some clothes. It's bartering, right? But you need to get something. Don't ever work for free. Second tip is um, hire the knowledge that you don't have. I'm pretty good at making sounds and all that sort of wonderful stuff, but I'm not good at counting. For this reason, I hire an accountant, right? And this person helps me, you know, go through, uh, you know, uh, tax and business and companies and all that sort of thing. Especially when you start getting some work and you have a fair bit of, you know, income coming in, especially from overseas. If you get a big chunk of it at once, the government can tax that pretty harshly. So you need accountants and things like that to help you shelter that income and things like that so you can actually, you know, make some money of what, you, what you're worth. Um, as well as counting, I'm not really good at reading. For this purpose, I hire a lawyer. A lawyer who reads through my contacts and all that sort of stuff. Trent put a wonderful uh, video up on IGDA the other day on the Facebook page uh, called Fuck You, Pay Me. And um, in there, he, he, uh, one of the questions that the guy said was, uh, he was asked, you know, when is the right time to hire a lawyer? And he gave the best answer which is the right time to hire a lawyer, is the time that you decide to become professional. The moment that you take it into a professional idea that you want to do it for a living, you want to do it for a career, is the right time to hire a lawyer. Cool. All right, number three. Work your money. If you have money sitting there from a couple of projects, it's not doing anything, make it do something. Put it into investments, buy shares if that's worth doing anymore. You know, work your money. You always want to have your money working for you. Don't just sitting there, etc., etc. All right, number four, be consistent. People will hire you because they know that you can do that work again and again and again over and over again. That's why you will continue to get work. If you do a really, 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 really good job on one project and that guy hires you back again and you do a really, 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 really crap pro, uh, uh, job, you're probably not going to get any work from that person again. So be consistent. Number five, be disciplined. I find... Uh, personally, I get a lot of people saying, oh, look, I'd love to go freelance. Do you want to give me some work? I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. And they say, look, I really don't want to, you know, have nine to five and I want to have my own hours and I want to work from home and I want to work in my pajamas and all that sort of stuff. But what they're really saying is I don't want to work. And that's the difference is that when you're going into freelancing and when you're kind of running business for yourself, it is a job like any other job. It's probably a better job. Maybe there's, you know, some more freedoms and things like that. You're doing it yourself. But at the end of the day, it is a job and you need to treat it like a job. You need to be disciplined with the work that comes in. When that work email comes in at like quarter to midnight, it's probably good to get onto it, you know. Um, be disciplined with it. Cool. So lastly, we're going to look at um, stay creative and uh, keep the passion. It's very, very... Uh, 
stressful, you know, when you've got project after project after project and, you know, it might be in a legal battle with this guy and this guy won't pay you and there's this problem over here and these guys just want that Skrillex song again and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very, very difficult to not become cynical. And I see a lot with, you know, guys that have been doing this for 20 odd years, they've become very cynical. And it's important to always have some sort of personal project going on, something interesting going on, some fun projects and things. You've got to try and stay creative throughout it. Stay true to yourself, some people say, but uh, keep that creativity going. All right, so we're now going to run off the top 10 reasons why I think people fail as uh, freelancers, uh, which is always good, worth looking at. So number 10, they're too independent. Often people want to do everything themselves. Do all the accountancy, do all the legal stuff, you know, set up the business, do their website, do all the emailing, do all the invoicing, etc., etc. If they're too independent and do too much themselves, they end up overworking and uh, burning themselves out, essentially. So number nine, they're too impatient. You can't expect this sort of thing to grow overnight. You can't expect that sort of work to come in straight away. Although you might be lucky, it may happen. But you've got to kind of understand it may take some time to get out there. Especially nowadays when there is a lot of people out there trying to do freelancing and stuff like that. Um, it will take some time. Number eight, too much how instead of why. How can I buy that BMW? Not why should I buy that BMW? How can I have the big studio? Not why do I need a big studio? How can I buy that $7,000 tablet? Do you need a $7,000 tablet? Ask why with everything. Because it's your business, every cent that runs through you, you need to be accountable for. You can't be loose with money or decisions or things like that. Ask why. Number seven, product before market. Don't go to the bank tomorrow and get a $500,000 loan and decide that you're going to build the next electric car. Is there a market for that sort of thing right at the moment? Well, that's a decision, but that's something you have to decide. It's very, very important that you just study the market that you're going into and that you understand what you're about to go into. And don't go too crazy creating something that has no market. That can be different and, you know, often you need to still kind of have an open mind and be creative and, you know, have your ideas as maybe this will work or this might be a game changer. You know, some woman like a couple of years ago came to me and said, I've got a great idea. We'll get these little characterizations of different family members and sell them to people and they can put it on the back of their car to show everybody what their family looks like. I would have said that's a stupid idea. <laughs> But she's gone on to make millions. I still think it's a stupid idea, but she's gone on to make a lot of money out of it, and good on her. All right, number six, they borrow money. To this day, after 12 years of doing freelancing, I now employ five different people. We've done about 50-something games. Uh, we've done about seven or eight games just this year alone. We had five games at E3. Um, you know, project after project after project. I've never borrowed a cent from a bank or anything. I've never even had government support. I've never gone to GDC with government payments or had government support or rental assistance or anything like that, never. If you're smart with your money, you won't need to. You don't need the BMW with a the, with the fancy sticker that says your business on the back of a, you know, all that sort of stuff. You don't need that stuff. Just be very, very careful with your money. Don't borrow money. The, the you know, big issue that I bought just the other day, the guy that I gave that $5 to, if you go and borrow money, he's richer than you. Because every cent that you earn after that, you owe to the bank plus some. So that person with $5 in their pocket is better off than you. Stay away from borrowing. Number five, too emotional. If Mitch here sends me some of his work and I say that shit, that's nothing against him at all. That's nothing against him. Often you probably don't want to work with people like that. <laughs> but Sometimes people can get very direct, especially people that have been doing, you know, especially in the industry for a long time, can get very direct, especially with freelancers. Uh, a guy that I work with a lot will send me an email after I've sent him some music at 2.30 in the morning. And his reply will be, shit, 
do it again, need it in two hours. Now, I'm getting to the stage where I'm kind of, you know, getting over that sort of stuff and, you know, it's a bit, bit stressful and all that sort of thing. But you can't take that stuff personally. If somebody on the internet is slagging off your work, don't take it personally. You know, you can't be too emotional. All right, number four, buy things they don't need. Don't buy a BMW. All right. Number three, uh, they don't see themselves as a business. That's the same sort of thing. It's just banging on the same sort of points. You need to understand that you need to keep the same amount of money coming in. You need to keep that less than what you have going out. If I had a bucket here of water and I was pouring water into the top of it and I started drilling holes into the bottom of the bucket, that's essentially what a business is. But the water coming out of those holes need to be less than the water coming in. Otherwise, your business is on a fast track to failure. Treat yourself like a business. All right, number two, lazy legals. It's very, 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 very important that you have all your legal stuff sorted out. Good contracts that tie up everything. This is really prevalent, especially if you're an indie developer and you hire somebody to create some art assets for you. And they're a good friend of yours or they're a buddy or something like that. And you say, ah, oh, it's all right, mate. We won't need any contracts or anything like that. And then a couple of years later, Zynga approach you and want to pay $150 million for your little indie startup. You love this idea. It's great. $150 million. How many BMWs could it buy? Now, when Zynga approach you, they will look through absolutely everything. All of your accounts, all of your contracts, everything. And if they find, which they probably will, that piece of art that you never had a contract for, you've got to contact that artist and do up a new agreement. Now, if I was that artist and I was just sitting there one day and I got a call saying, oh, you know that project we did a couple of years ago? Well, I need a contract for that. I'd have alarm bells going off in my head. I'd go, hang on, why? You know that $150 million you want? Yeah, well, I want half of that. And they're allowed to. Um, and it's not just with business. You need your legal solid with your personal life. And this is a little bit hard to talk about and all that sort of thing, but it is very, very important, especially if you're about to get married or something like that. It is very important that you have a prenuptial agreement in place. And, and it's a bit of a laughing matter and all that sort of thing, and there's been lots of, lots of cases all around the world with divorces and people losing money and all that sort of stuff. But it's more, if something happens to me, for example, if I get sued and I'm very upset about being sued and I go and end myself, my wife could be liable for all that sort of stuff that I'm being sued for if we don't have a proper prenuptial agreement. So not only is it important to have that, but it could potentially hurt the other person as well. Um, so yeah, that's a really good thing. Good legals. And number one thing, bad managers. You've got to treat yourself like a manager as well. You can't take on too much work. You can't take on too many commitments. You need to have a very clear understanding about what you're doing and how much work you can actually produce. Uh, you need to understand things like that water bucket. If you've got more money dripping out of that than you do coming in, you're a bad manager. If you've gone and borrowed money and you can't pay that stuff back, you're a bad manager. You need to be very good at managing your time, energy, and money. So lastly, you know, don't let any of that sort of stuff scare you or anything like that. I'd really encourage you to go off and try the world of freelancing. A lot of the time you can do it while keeping a day job. Give it a try. Find some of those skills that you have and exploit them. Go out there and earn that money. If your skills aren't earning money for you, you're doing something wrong. Get out there and give it a try. Uh, your whole concept of money changes. Uh, I'm, I'm you know, needing a new tattoo down here. I want a new tattoo, right? And I know to get that, I need to write about two and a half minutes worth of music. So I'm thinking if I write two and a half minutes of music, I'll have that and it'll all turn into a tattoo. Or a nice dinner or something like that. That's about 15 seconds of music, right? So you, you start thinking completely differently. But I really encourage you to try it. There's only two times in your life when you can try something. When you should have and right now. Thank you very much.